Oh, there he is. Oh, there we go. Yeah, I'm there so we funny. go. We're showing the <laughs> screaming horrible to weather. people to piss off horrible everyone. Weather. <laughs> hey, Ryan, congratulations. I heard you got married. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> hey, Frank, good job fitting your large head in the frame. <laughs> What's up, buddy? <laughs> it was pretty difficult. Ryan, you look like a Taliban. <laughs> like a what? Taliban. Taliban. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for being with us. Today we have a special session in terms of understanding the experience of our friends. We are here with uh, three different cases, uh, all today friends before clients of For Him Dating. I am at the moment in Portugal. All of my friends here uh, with us are in the United States. We all shared a common issue that is how to bring your wife to the United States, especially now that Ukraine is. So Mike also have a problem with a dog. Uh, Mike, I will start it. Okay, go pick up that stupid dog I that I bought you. I'm gonna. I'll be back in one minute. I'm gonna get a coffee while Mike's chasing his dog down. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we have here Ryan, we have here Frank, and we have here Michael. All of them have a great thing in common. All of them have a Ukrainian wife in the United States today, and some of them even during when the war started. So I ask them a special favor to come here today and share with us their experience because all of them have different ways of achieving their goals. Some are still on the process. Ryan had the opportunity to get married in Mexico and brought his wife to the US. Frank got married in Ukraine. I have the honor and the pleasure to be at his wedding. And the wife went to the United States through Poland already on the period of war. Michael had a K-1 fiancé visa. I was supposed to help to take his fiancé to the States. She walked 25 kilometers by herself, crossed the border, arrived in the United States for him to get married this April. So this is all extraordinary experiences. But for now, we will ask them, and we start with Ryan, to tell the main topic, the topics of their process and what was the determined success, success in terms of what really dictated their luck and what facilitated them to have the wife today in the United States. So welcome, Ryan. Uh, congratulations for your achievement, recently married. Congratulations. Thank you. And, uh, Tell us, how did you manage to bring your wife to the United States? So for us, we were in Mexico, um, kind of fortunate for the situation when the war broke out and already had the plan to get married there in Mexico. So we just moved forward with that. Um, in terms of getting to the USA, um, the process, we did a lot of trying to get answers from the U.S. Embassy and from the Customs Immigration Service, and it was really hard trying to get answers on what's the way to do things and a lot of just bureaucratic runaround. So we got some advice from actually an immigration attorney uh, to just present at the border to the United States and request either asylum or um, what's called humanitarian parole. So we decided to go that route. Um, I flew back to the United States. I had some family issues going on at the time. We bought her a ticket to fly to Tijuana, which is on the border with San Diego to the United States. Um, I then flew down to San Diego. I rented a car in the USA. You can pay a little bit for the insurance and drive the car to Mexico. So I did that. I picked the car up in San Diego. I drove down to Tijuana, uh, met her at the airport in Tijuana when she flew in. 
And then we stayed that evening um, in a hotel there in Tijuana. The next morning we drove to the border. Um, from what I've been told, we did not try walking across, but as I've been told, the walking across is much more difficult, a lot more people and a lot harder to get onto US um, soil to request asylum. So that's why we did the driving. Um, the line, we went early in the morning, so the line was only a couple hours until we got up um, to where the crossing, the cars crossed the, the line into the United States. They were stopping cars on that day before they crossed that line and asking them to show their documents. When they saw that I was an American and I had a Ukrainian in the car with me, they did stop us um, and they put down like a, a strip in front of the tires so I couldn't move and they said, stay where you're at. Um, they were very polite, very friendly about it, just explaining the process that we got to stay there. They called on the radio back to whoever was in charge saying that they had somebody that was Ukrainian. And then after probably about two to three minutes, the call came back on the radio to allow us to proceed across the line into the U.S. soil up to the um, where the, the actual booth is with the border agent. So uh, we did that. We got up to the booth. Um, I presented both of our passports. I said that we're here to seek uh, humanitarian parole or asylum for my wife. Uh, they were very friendly through the whole process. They said, okay, they just asked some information like um, how long we've been in Mexico, uh, where we were headed to the United States and some th things like that. After that, they directed us to a secondary screening area that's across past the, the border booth. Um, so we went up there, we parked, the, another person came out that was kind of more of a, a supervisor and took down our information, took the passports. And there was another car that came in behind us. I think it's worth noting. Um, this is a car with a Ukrainian family. It was a mother, a father, a little boy and a little girl. And they were being driven by just uh, an American couple, um, no relation, just uh, they'd, they'd driven down across the border to find Ukrainians that were trying to seek um, refuge in the United States. And so they also gathered their information at the same time. Um, this family had requested asylum at the, the border crossing. However, when they heard us that we were doing humanitarian parole, they asked to switch. Um, They're told first that you can't switch once you already declare a certain um, classification. But then after discussion, they decided to allow them to also switch to humanitarian parole. Uh, the key that, factor... Uh, sorry to interrupt you there. That is really a, a very important detail. Can you help us to understand what is the dif difference between both options? I, I can try a little bit. I'm still not an expert myself. We, we asked when... Once we got there, and I kind of skipped this, once we got there in that parking area, the supervisor asked me, so are you requesting humanitarian parole or asylum? Because you said both, you have to pick one. And I asked her why I really don't know what the difference is, which we should do. She said, I can't tell you what to do, but both ways she's going to be most likely allowed into the US, but with asylum, um, she'll be here for two or three days in detention in holding uh, while we process her request for asylum, paperwork, et cetera. The other is option- Is that detention, uh, sorry to interrupt you, is that detention like we can imagine about refugees, lots of people on a cell or is a, a more moderated way of detention? Did you have right. the opportunity to understand that? I, I didn't ask about that, but as I understand it, they try to make it as nice as possible, but it is a, you know, a lot of people that are in detention and they have, I don't know if sell is the right word, but it's it's not the ideal situation somebody wants to be in. Um, even if it's only for a couple of days, it's nobody wants, especially if it's you're talking to your wife or family member, you don't want them to get you know stuck in there for, for two or three days. And so the other option, the humanitarian parole, she said, if you want parole, um, what we'll do is we'll take her, we'll process the, the paperwork, and then within probably two or three hours, she'll be on her way with you here um, into the US. So at that point, we were like, well, we'll, we'll definitely go with parole then. <laughs> um, and that was why the family that was in the car behind us then asked to change their request because they didn't know any of that either. Um, and then they allowed her them also to change their request. And it, I think it's really important to note here that for, for people that are trying to follow the process, even if it's we're not just talking marriage or family, this is a family that was there with, with a couple in a car that was not their family. 
Um, they were just fleeing from Ukraine and trying to um, get to the US. And this is just a family that was trying to do be helpful and, and bring them over. And so they were still allowed to request. And so they, we had to stay out in the cars. They took them into the, the building there to do the paperwork. They took their passport, you know, with them and their passports. And about an hour to an hour and a half later, um, she came back out with them and she had her passport and she had her card stamped and everything that she had one year of humanitarian parole. And at the same time, this family also came out um, with the same thing. All of their passports, they got stamped for the humanitarian parole for one year. And so both my wife and this family is in the car behind us. All were granted the humanitarian parole. It took about an hour and a half and then allowed to, to leave the area and proceed into the United States. Um, and, so and that the was fact her. that uh, the officers knew that she was officially your wife, it did not represent a problem for them to give them a parole to the United States valid for one year, for one year right? It did not seem like it. Uh, because so we told them from the beginning, hey, this is my wife and I'm here seeking asylum or humanitarian parole for her. So we pointed out that she was my wife from the beginning, but they never like asked details about, you know, documents, who, uh, which would be the documents that you would advise others that are listeners to carry along with them in case they will be necessary to facilitate crossing the border. So, of course, passports. I mean, that's that's kind of a given. Um, beyond the passport, um, if you come through Mexico, having the, the Mexican immigration certificate. So when you enter Mexico, they make you fill out this little card when you come through the, the Mexican immigration people, like when you fly in. Um, you have to fill out this card and then they'll tear it in half. They'll keep one half. And then there's this little page that they give you and tell you to keep in your passport. Um, it's a good idea to make sure and have that as well. And then beyond that, there really wasn't anything that they asked for documentation wise. If you're married, it helps to have a, a copy of the marriage certificate, but it was not necessary. Um, clearly not necessary for the family behind us because they weren't, you know, being brought in by a spouse or anything. You have with you the marriage certification with apostille that for sure will allow you to apply for a green card otherwise you would correct correct um we did have that but it, it again I, I don't feel like it was necessary because the family behind us was allowed in exactly the same as as lena was um the they were really i mean so they were really friendly. I think that's worth pointing out. It was clear that they wanted to do all they could to help um, Ukrainians come in. It wasn't like they were trying to find ways to deny or reject them or keep them from coming in. So they were very friendly, very helpful, wanted to try to help them um, to get in within the, you know, the rules and, and whatnot that they have to follow. Um, uh -huh. They also were helpful in, in answering the questions of, you know, what do we do next? What's the process? You know, um, we have, you have a year that, of parole during this process, you know, you're going to need to either submit for, um, the green card or some sort of change of status, or you'll have to leave, you know, after the one year. Um, and so the, of course that'll be different for every situation for an American. That's the, the I-130 that you'd submit, um, to get the green card for, for somebody that's not a spouse. It'd be, you know, I'm not sure what the form would be. It's a little bit different process, but. Okay, uh, uh, the, the last question I would like to put is that I had some reports that Ukrainian women sometimes have the life a little bit difficult to pass Mexican border, especially when they land in the airport. There's a bunch of questions going on. Did your wife have that same situation? So we didn't have that situation when we first entered Mexico. We entered in Cancun. Um, and we didn't have that situation, but there also wasn't the war at that time. When I flew her from Cancun to Tijuana, um, I wasn't with her because I'd gone back to the U.S. She did get questioned there in Tijuana, and I think it's because of the proximity to the U.S. border. Um, she got asked, you know, what was she doing there? What was the purpose? Where was she headed? Um, they took her passport, and they, they kept her. There was her and, and quite a few other Ukrainians also that were in there that they kind of put in this room, um, not a detention room, but kind of like this room off to the side and were asking for their passports and questions. Um, 
you know, I, I, they were all released and allowed to go um, further on. Um, my wife was the last one that was released and it may be because I was raising a, a, a fuss with the immigration authorities on the outside of the airport because why was my wife being held? And so <laughs> it probably caused more problems for her on the inside because of that. Um, but it, it, ultimately they all were allowed to pass through. They did just get stopped for a while and ask questions what they were doing and where they were headed and see their passport, et cetera. Okay, Ryan, thank you so much. I, I invite you to stay as long as you can. I know that you have your affairs. So at any moment that this conversation will be with our next two friends, if you need to leave, you are welcome and I appreciate your help. If you have any added value to add to the conversation while you are with us, please feel free to do it. Uh, now I would uh, go to Michael because Frank is almost an expert on all these things. So I want him to have a last word because you have been an advisor for all of us. So Mike have an incredible story as well because Mike uh, have his fiance at his place now in Florida. They are going to get married and I really hope to be there for that. I'm doing my best to do it and think be present as something historical because it took for us some time this to happen. And uh, Mike applied for the K-1 visa. So as you can understand, Ryan went with a girlfriend that we helped him to find and got married past the board. Mike was here long time, several experience till he succeed. And frankly, we'll listen later. He made a spouse visa. So all to all the three different ways of doing. Mike, I remember he applied for the K-1 visa. His wife was probably the last fiancé stamp in anyone's passport that got out from the American embassy in Kia. So, and uh, his wife really had an exceptional determination. Uh, though she was supposed to go with me, she went with the bag, with the dog. She went to Kiev from Poltava. She stayed there with the mother. And then they walked miles and miles and miles. Just, it's not a funny detail, but for our audience to understand, Mike found, and I think this is not in confidence, Mike found her shoes in the garbage bin with holes. This girl make holes on the shoes to arrive to the other side. Uh, uh, I apologize. Sometimes my voice tremble because I also know what is to leave the country and leave family behind, cross this crazy border. So when I speak about border, it's something that <laughs> affects me. So long story short and happy end, Mike, tell us a little bit your version and the way that you felt this and what were the points that really created the success that you are enjoying today? So we filed a K-1 visa in, in January of 2021 and the end of 2021, December, she went for the medical. They uh, said she had chronic bronchitis and they needed to monitor her for two months. So that put us into February. The medical re results were released, sent to the embassy. They didn't do anything the first day. The next day, which was a Saturday, the embassy sent everybody's passports back, including hers. On Sunday, they closed. The following week, we had to wait for her passport to come back, but she got it like Tuesday of the following week. She has the date of that Saturday. So she probably got the last visa issued by the US government in Kiev. Uh, so I then wanted to buy her a plane ticket. Uh, I was having difficulties because she has a dog that she was bringing with her. Uh, one airline wouldn't let the dog on no matter what, because in the meantime, CDC put a dog ban on all dogs from Ukraine. Uh, I was able to get a letter from the CDC, bought her a ticket. You were coming with her to escort her here. And you know that story. They closed, closed the skies down and uh, she went to Kiev to be with her mother. 
you stayed in Poltava. Uh, she was with the mother for three days through the war. There was threats of bombing buses and trains leaving the Kiev. She finally found a train that her and her mother got on, got to Lviv, very crowded train. Uh, martial law was going on, you couldn't go on the streets. They stayed in the, in the train station for seven hours, waiting for sunlight to come up where they can move about. Uh, they then got a bus ride to the border, uh, walked about 12, 12 to 15 miles to get across the border. Uh, all this time, it's, it's 30 degrees, you know, minus one in Ukraine in Celsius. Uh, they got across the border, got a car ride to Warsaw, and uh, they arrived in Warsaw three in the morning on a Monday. I bought them a hotel room, bought her a plane ticket a few days later and flew her in from Warsaw to uh, Miami. The mother, in the meantime, uh, she has a, sister, a daughter in New Jersey married. The brother-in-law, or the son-in-law, my future brother-in-law, was able to get her an emergency visa interview with the U.S. Embassy uh, like three days after you know, they, they arrived in, in Warsaw. Uh, it was approved. She got her visa, her passport with the visa in it back the next week. Uh, you know, Tanya, my, my fiance, was already flown to Miami at this point. The mother got her uh, visa. So now that we don't have Mike here, uh, tell us, please, how was your process? Was really an advantage that you made the spouse visa, got married here, and then go there? I know that you have a major issue now with your stepson that is part of your wife. And, uh, the kind of the, the marriage is not 100% till that kid is there back with you too. So now you are struggling, following a little bit uh, Ryan's idea. Could you share with your plans and how you think it will work because it's still to come this weekend? Okay, well, first, um, let me describe um, my situation or my process with my with my wife here. Um, I, I was married in Ukraine back in July of 2021. And uh, I was considering both either an immigrant visa, which is spousal visa, and also the non-immigrant K-1 visa. Uh, for my situation, I decided to uh, pursue, get married and pursue a spouse visa. Um, so I was married in July um, of 2021. I submitted to USCIS my uh, I-130 application for a spousal visa. And um, right now the process between a spousal visa and a, um, and a fiance visa is about the same. And I think on the average, it's taking about seven months, eight months. Um, I was following the news and also um, my background um, is also as a consultant to the Department of Defense and I've been a defense contractor for 35 years. And um, I sort of thought that this threat that of Russia on the border with Ukraine would become real. Um, so I, I contacted my local congressman that was able to help expedite um, my fiance, I mean, my spousal visa uh, to get immediately expedited through USCIS and then to the State Department. At the State Department, it was, it was uh, approved within 24 hours and went to the U uh, U.S. Embassy in Kyiv. Um, it was at the U.S. Embassy in Kyiv for two weeks, and we were able to get that expedited and, um, and have her visa interview. Now, all this occurred before the war actually started uh, with, the, with the threat of uh, Russia attacking and invading uh, Ukraine. So we had our visa interview February 3rd. And then she was able to get her visa about one week later. Alex, uh, well, with respect to the conversation with Ryan on asylum versus a humanitarian parole request, there's a, there's like some, um, how should I say, um, there's, there is a distinction between the two. Now, a humanitarian parole is a non-immigrant visa and it's temporary. An asylum request is more for has a stronger pathway for a green card or for a, um, a permanent residence. Uh, one of the issues with asylum is that usually it's reserved for people who are being persecuted. So if they're in a particular 
a political group or a particular orientation and the government cannot protect them, that's where they can ask for asylum. So typically what they'll do is they'll hold them for three days, they'll release them, but then they'll have to go before a judge and make their case for asylum. If they're denied, then they will be deported. If it's approved, then they can stay and then there's a pathway to get their green card to stay in the United States as an immigrant. Now, leaving Ukraine because of war is not a rationale for asylum. Um, I know that there's been a lot of debate in terms of that regard that the current administration is perhaps rubber stamping people who are requesting asylum from Ukraine. However, that really hasn't been tested in the courts yet. So the, the most expeditious way for a person to get into the United States is to request a humanitarian parole. At that point, after they get in, then they can determine what process or approach that they wanna take if they decide that they wanna remain in the United States. Now, here's another difference between uh, applying for humanitarian parole outside the country versus going to the border. Um, going to the border and, um, and then requesting humanitarian parole has a lower threshold. For example, when you apply through the normal process of the USCIS, you have to have a beneficiary, meaning who is gonna be financially responsible for you in the United States. If you don't have someone in the United States, then you have to demonstrate that you are financially independent or capable of doing that for yourself. So you're gonna to have to provide documents of bank records, assets, and that sort of information just to prove that if they let you in the United States that you can support yourself. Um, the other difference I wanna mention here is that the Biden administration announced last week that they're gonna allow 100,000 uh, Ukrainian refugees into the country. Now, what, what is said in a political speech versus implementation is two different things. It will, it, right now, the government can't determine how it's going to actually implement uh, humanitarian parole in the United States. Also, what he stated and what the news reports have said that he's limiting the humanitarian parole or of refugees based on people who have relatives in the United States. Now, right now at the border, that's not being implemented because there is not an official policy. So if the people are from Ukraine and they want to flee and come here to the United States, then um, they're not being, those tests aren't being applied. So they can, so people who don't even have relatives here can get in on a humanitarian parole at the border which is not true if they're trying to do it out of the country through the normal process. So I think I just wanna make sure that your listeners understand the differences. Um, and also, if you're applying for a humanitarian parole outside the United States, um, it's taking about seven or eight months, unless you can actually get it expedited. Go ahead. Let me put that question that for sure is crossing the head of lots of people. It's like, I have a girlfriend back in the United States. What is the best way for me to bring her into the United States? You mean you have a girlfriend back in Ukraine? I have a girlfriend in Ukraine. And how am I going to bring her to the States without having to cross all this harassment of paperwork thing? I think the, the easiest way right now is to fly to Mexico and probably cross one of the United States border crossing. So either Arizona, Texas, or California is she basically presents her passport, asks for humanitarian parole, and, um, and she'll be allowed to come in the United States. I think the difficulty will be, as Ryan mentioned, that he had some issues with his, uh, his wife getting past the Mexican immigration Tijuana. Um, I'll, I'll personally tell you that before I was married to my wife, Nadia, we met three times in Mexico. Two of the times she was detained by Mexican authorities for about an hour and a half at the Cancun airport. So, um, th and this was all prior to the war in Ukraine. So I think the Mexican authorities in terms of immigration are very critical of people coming into their country with the concern that they may stay in Mexico. If a person's coming from Ukraine or some other country, if they have a round trip ticket, if they show that they're um, the length of stay at a, at a hotel in Mexico, 
um, I think they're not as concerned because they know that they have a place to stay and they're coming and leaving. To me, the most convenient and best scenario is the one that um, kind of was described by Ryan, that is someone would come from the United States with a vehicle, pick, pick that person up and then bring them back over to the United States. Um, they avoid the pedestrian uh, crossing um, and intermingling with the general population. I think that's probably the most secure way of doing it. But also there's other stories out there that people have just shown up from Ukraine as a refugee and they don't have um, you know, someone to drive them over or they don't necessarily know someone in the United States and they're able to still get into the United States. So uh, just to finish, to let you go as well, because you guys are all starting your working day. Uh, what is your projects about your stepson? What is your plan to make him come to join the mother and you? Okay, so we didn't really describe the situation or the setup here, but you know, my wife is in, in, uh, in the US with me in Minnesota. Uh, she has a stepson. I have a stepson, her son. He fled Ukraine on, uh, on February 12th, just before the war broke out. Um, he's currently staying in Spain. Um, prior to that, I was in process of getting him um, a student visa uh, because he had been accepted to a college in, in Florida. He, had a, he was able to obtain a, an emergency interview with my assistant at the U.S. Embassy in Spain he was denied a student visa because he didn't show strong ties back to Ukraine, which, which is kind of ridiculous because, you know, we're at war. I mean, Ukraine's at war with Russia and, you know, you can't predict the future, but the counselor officer at his discretion decided to deny a student visa, despite the fact he's been approved by a college in the U S all the fees have been paid. And, 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 and that he should be permitted to come here. So um, I have um, applied for a humanitarian parole with USCIS through the normal process, but um, because it's take, it will take like seven or eight months and his time is running out where he can stay in Spain. And this is a kind of a nuance too, because he left Ukraine before the war started, he's still limited to the 90 days cumulative in all you and you um eu countries so um my choice is to i'm going to fly today to france to meet with my stepson i'm going to escort him to mexico and then present him at the border uh this next tuesday uh to request a humanitarian parole very nice of you to go pick up him he's he's already grown up person he will not have problems in terms of mother or father permissions but still is a hell of an experience that you are going to smooth it for him for sure. So wish you best luck and we will be looking forward to know the happy hand of that. We just landed in Tijuana and now we're going to baggage claim. About 75% of the people that were on the plane from Mexico City to uh, Tijuana were from Ukraine. So it's early morning here, it's about 8.35, 8.40. So now we have my old friend Mike to tell me, Mike, I, it's something that I would like to ask you. I didn't ask to them, but how is your future wife moved about having abandoned Ukraine, I know she would not suffer much because the mother is there as well. So the sister is there as well. So she's not the kind of person that left lots of family or relatives behind. But did she adapt well to the States? Is she missing home? There's nothing to miss home now at the moment besides people. But uh, how is the new experience? Well, first off, she is here with me in beautiful, sunny Florida, and she loves the Florida. She loves the weather. She loves the house. And uh, I don't really see any signs of trauma. And I've asked her if she's fine. You know, she kind of went through the, you know, just getting out of the country, you know, being in the city and they were 
sleeping in the in the basement, you know, in the, in the middle of the night when they were bombing key, spots in Kiev. Uh, you know, just it's got to be traumatic just to be able to, to, to go through something like that. I've never experienced anything like that. Uh, you have because you were still there. It's a, an uneasy feeling, and I, I, you would think something you would have some of it still, you know, maybe a nightmare or something. She seems perfectly fine. She's met some friends here already. She's, you know, today she was supposed to go on a horseback riding lesson. You know, she's just uh, living, living life large. She's uh, like very, very happy. Yeah, it was really, really a, a lucky strike that was really for us was something stressful with the passport in the embassy. And if it doesn't go up, it's not even to have the visa, it's to have even the passport. Mm -hmm. Without it, you could not go even anywhere, not even speak yeah. in the United States. Like I said, when they sent her passport back, we we thought it was a 50-50 shot if she had this the visa in there or not. But at least she was going to get her passport back. I would have flew her into Mexico or somewhere and, and did something else, you know. But luckily, okay. she had the visa and was able to fly to America. Just had to escape the, the country first. There's another detail there that I know that some of our friends also use, but I wanted to ask your opinion is some people use the fact to talk to the, the local senator or the governor. Is there any advantage or any possible help on that direction that could help any American citizen to expedite any case or it's all more conversation than effective help? I'm having a difficult time hearing you because my neighbors decide to mow his lawn for two hours. But oh, uh, it's always like that. But uh, we are listening. Uh, to you know, of course. Case. But uh, no, I reached out to uh, the local congressman here in my uh, uh, city. Uh, he had an office here, and I talked to his, one of his head guys, chief of staff, or something for him. And uh, they actually helped me with with the. Uh, uh, obtaining a CDC dog license uh, to import her dog. Like I said, uh, they blocked all imports of dogs. And uh, I reached out to them again to help with the mother-in-law. And, you know, they told me nothing really they could do. It might take a year to two years. And here the her son-in-law was able to get her an interview in three days, you know, uh, and, you know, emergency interview went well and she, I know, the story. Week. I know the story and obviously is is not something that we can recommend as a, a standard or a rule procedure but right. can you share what was the really motive for the American embassy to book your future mother-in-law an interview in well, three days uh, you get a drop down list if you file online which he did and pretended that he was her and wrote it in her you know in her name and saying I'm so and so and uh, the, in the drop-down menu, there's not many choices to select from. So she selected funeral slash death. And in her thing, she said, I'm sorry, I didn't know what to pick, but the funeral will be for me if I return to Kiev. That was a poetic one. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I'm surprised they even, like, even looked at this seriously. But they, she, he sent that in on a Monday. On Tuesday, they approved her interview. She went to the interview on a Thursday, that same Thursday, you know, so, and they, they approved it on Thursday. So filed it on Monday, she had a approval for a visa on Thursday. And I think the following Tuesday or Wednesday, she got her visa back. That is right. So anybody, any Ukrainians coming in after March, they said they were going to extend it up to 18 months to just, you know, be able to stay in America. So, right. Cause there's only three ways to get a visa to come here. The way Frank did with marriage out, out, out of the country and come on a, a spousal visa, fiance visa, which I ran, you know, I did, and that's how I got my uh, fiance here. And the third option is just a travel visa. And the travel visas, they've been uh, uh, okay enough for 10 year visa, but you could come for six months and then you have to leave for six months. So far, there's just spousal, fiance, and travel. So if you get them over here and they, they give them a visa for something, marry them and wait out the you know, if they got 18 months, you got a year and a half to, to live together. I got 90 days. You know, my girl got here March 2nd. I, I got till June 1st. Okay. 
I will be there at the end of this month of April for sure. And uh, just to finish with the happy end thing, seems we have 18 months to find a husband to your mother. -in -law. Yeah, uh, so uh, I'm, I'm going to start doing that once she comes down to Florida and spend some time with us. Hey, just don't steal my business. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, thank you so much. Yep, you're see welcome. You soon. All right, you better be <laughs> counting on you.